Hello. All right, hi everyone. Um, it's three o'clock, but I figure we might just um, let a few more people trickle in. Um, I am Jenna Trench, online course design coordinator, formerly biology instructor at CRC. And um, we're gonna be talking about the online course design template today. Can you all hear me? Thumbs up if you can, okay. Cool, great. Feels so strange. Um, <laughs> so um, as far as uh, handling um, questions and stuff, um, since there are not very many of us, feel free to just unmute, unmute yourself and just throw out a question anytime I mention something that's unclear or you want more explanation on. Sound good? All right, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I am going to place a link in the chat and this link is a how-to document that I will be um, referring to as we talk about the CRC online course template. So I'll wait until I see a few people populating in my Google Doc there. All right, I see that a few of you have gotten it, so that's great news. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to share my screen. All right, so here we are. I've got my screen shared and I need to remind myself that I have two screens. So sometimes if you see me looking off like this, that's because I'm staring at my other screen. Okay, so um, first off, the CRC online course template is something um, that we built uh, for you, for anyone who's teaching online. And the CRC online course template has a whole bunch of resources in it. So what I'm showing you right now is my version, the master version of the online course template, but I will show you eventually how to get it into your own courses. So can you all see my screen? Yeah, okay, awesome. All right, so the CRC online course template has some items in it that may be of use to you. The template itself was built as part of our fast track program, um, which is uh, of assisting online instructors to align their courses with the CVC OEI course design rubric. So it's like quality standards for online classes. Um, so the rubric um, kind of ticks a bunch of those boxes. So if you import it into your class, um, your class will already be aligned with a number of items of the rubric. So we start off with a sample homepage. This sample homepage is one that um, has a lot of things in it that you might find useful, um, like contact information that you can populate with your own stuff, um, a little table of contents here for all of the modules. This is particularly useful if your modules are very long, having a interactive table with links in it at the um, very start of the class can sometimes work a little bit better than directing your students to click on the modules area because that way you can give them a little jump directly to that page without having to move anything around in your modules area so it's just a little best practice thing um, and also in the template we've included a whole bunch of resources in the instructor resources hidden module, um, there are instructions for how to use the template once you've already installed it. Um, some suggestions for resources to refer to when you're looking at your course design, um, essentially like how to build an effective online class. Uh, a checklist for accessibility, 
And accessibility basically means is your class going to um, sort of accommodate students um, with different needs at the very beginning of the class, anticipating the needs for say captions on your videos and structured formatting and headings and alternative text for students who are using screen readers, etc. So there are some tips in there. Uh, and then also uh, an equity minded approach. It's a syllabus quiz to see if your um, if your quiz is um, and do the way your excuse me, see if your syllabus and your class is approaching um, instruction um, from an equity standpoint. And then also a new thing that I've added in here, which is a guide for how to use Confer Zoom. Um, and we have um, now uh, some additional Zoom support. So some of this may not actually be relevant, but it's in there anyway. <laughs> Uh, and then also um, in the modules area, we have um, stuff for lab instructors. And then most importantly, and I think this is the part you might be really interested in, is an orientation module. And an orientation module takes a long time to put together, especially when you're trying to anticipate all of the needs for your students that are taking this class online. And if you've never taught online before, it's hard to know what those needs are going to be. So what we've got here are a series of pages um, that will address all of the common concerns associated with taking any college class, but then also specific concerns about communication with your instructor, how instructor, instructors can expect to interact with the course materials, how they can expect to interact with you, um, what your grading policies are, all in an easy to access format, rather than being in a syllabus document, we suggest you put a lot of your stuff actually on these pages. So I'll just give you um, a little brief tour of some of the items that we have in the demo orientation module. The first is a welcome page. Now this welcome page is really generic and anywhere where I see an opportunity for you to tailor it to your class, I place, let me increase the text size here so it's a little bit easier to see. I place um, purple font. So anytime you see purple, that's where essentially you can add stuff to it. And um, I'll go over later how to actually edit these pages. Um, but for right now, I just sort of wanna show you um, what some of the things are in here. So we've got a welcome message from your instructor. It's always a good way to start off the class is welcoming your students and telling them maybe a little bit about the class and why they're here. And then we have um, sections for how to use the Canvas course specifically, including links um, already in the class for self-enroll, self-paced courses for students to learn how to be an online student. And so these classes are really nice. And in fact, at the end of the second class here, the online learning readiness tutorials, students can get a certificate that they can share with you to prove that they've taken the class. We also have specific course related information in here. So um, things that students might need for the class, learning objectives for the class, information about you. I can't remember if I included a sample here. I didn't, but I can show you one of my getting to know you pages. Um, essentially, it just has a bunch of pictures of myself and information about who I am, kind of just to give students an idea of, you know, yeah, I love to read science fiction and I really love to ride my bike and go rock climbing and that kind of stuff. And then we also have um, support services in here. Now this is really super duper important now, especially with our students being online and being at a distance to us. They can't just approach us after class um, or in office hours. They may not feel comfortable or able to have a video chat with you. Um, so providing them with information about the services available to them, especially the remote services available to them is super duper helpful. So once again, we have links to all of the um, pages on our updated website uh, for that information about students receiving accommodations and tutoring and that sort of thing. All right, so last thing that I wanna show you in here before we get to how to is the um, assessments. So you're probably going to be having assessments in your class, right, to assess your learning objectives. And depending on your course, um, you may want to have assessments that are file submissions, 
you may want to have quizzes. Discussions are always a great idea because they help replicate some of the um, enga engaging activities that you may have had in your face to face class and then also exams. And on each of these assignments, I've included um, suggestions for what to write and then a sample format. I recommend that you stick with this format if you install this in one of your classes. And the reason being is because it has a whole bunch of help items for students that we may not realize we need until you're partway through the semester. These are um, these questions that I have here are based on my experience teaching online for a long time and knowing what students are going to ask about. So by anticipating their needs, they've already got that help right in there. So basically all you have to do is plug and play, put your instructions in here and then um, set the assignment up points and due dates and all of that yourself. Okay, any questions so far? No? Okay, remember if you do have a question, you are currently muted. So you'll wanna use your um, unmute button down at the, um, the toolbar at the bottom of the page for your um, I do have a question. Great. Uh, hi, I'm Jackie uh, Mathis, and I'm uh, a counselor and coordinator of the Student Service Program. Yeah. And so um, I last semester was my first time teaching online. So mm -hmm. I did the whole rush thing Mar in March to set it up and all that. And of course, yeah. I, I taught a class this summer, and so I felt uh, more comfortable this summer. So I'm here to learn a little bit more, but I haven't used the discussion board yet, and I wanted to use that. And so uh, can you go over that a little bit? Because I haven't used it yet. Happy to. So dis discussions are, um, they're wonderful. Uh, they're also rather time consuming on the instructor's part. I'm just going to put that out there. Okay, However, okay. I love discussions because with the right prompt um, discussion topic, uh, you can really engage the students, not only with each mm -hmm. other, but also with the material. Mm -hmm. So um, basically what you do is when you create a discussion, you're going to provide them in the discussion instructions. Let me just go into edit here so you can sort of see what it would look like. Okay. So in the instructions area, you're going to be adding a prompt, instructions, what you want students to do. So in, my, in this particular sample prompt, I want them to find a YouTube video related to one of the chapters that we've been covering and then describe what's in there and why they found it useful. Okay. And so I have instructions for what I want them to do in their post and then also expectations for how they should reply to their classmates. Um, plus some additional resources here. If they've never used discussions before, they may not know how to embed a video or whatever. So discussions are really nice. If you give open-ended topics that, like that, like go out on the web, find a resource, and then share back here, then that gives students a lot of flexibility in terms of how um, they interact with the content. So some students may find a video, some students may find an article, others may find like another instructor's website. And so it's, it's just a great way for students to um, demonstrate that they're learning about the material. So you want to make sure that you have something in your prompt to say, you want to relate this to whatever we're talking about this week, right? Okay. So demonstrate that you recognize the connections. Um, but then also, it's just that opportunity for exchange and for students to talk to each other about stuff. And I find that because of the sort of quasi-anonymous um, uh, environment that we live in in online classes, mm -hmm. students are really much more likely to share and contribute, especially the introverts, than they are in a face-to-face -face class. Oh, and I yeah. have students who admit, you know, like, I'm an introvert, I never leave the house, I, you know, like, I don't have a lot of friends, but I loved the discussions because it was mm -hmm. just like Reddit, you know, like, I got mm -hmm. to interact with my classmates without the pressure of that face-to-face -face interaction. So you want to kind of exploit that. Yeah, and I noticed that in my summer class, um, because I can, in what I teach the college success, I can teach pretty much everything, and it's pretty much learning about yourself and and um, you know, just being aware of yourself and what it takes for you to be a college student. And so what I saw that I had never seen in class in all the years that I've been teaching is that they did a lot of group discussion on their own. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you know, they met with each other and, and talked about the chapters and stuff on their own. Mm -hmm. I didn't even initiate that. And, and you can actually, if you want, you can facilitate that by creating a graded discussion about that where mm -hmm. students have to post a question and then answer another student's question. Okay. And so I often do that in the weeks leading up to a, uh, to a major assessment, either a major project or if you're having an exam, an exam. And so students can post questions from the review um, or things that they're not sure about, and then they can and they can get graded for basically helping each other out. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. We we also encourage um, as part of sort of like you know good practices to get into in an online class is you have two sort of open discussions. Um, one specifically for course related questions, questions that um, students may want to ask you, but they don't really know where to ask it. Um, it's the same sort of questions you might get in an email, but the advantage is if students post them in the Q&A discussion, then everyone else gets to see the answer too. So if they had the same question, um, they'll already, they won't have to bother you. And so I usually, when I get a question like, you know, um, how do I do blank? I usually say, that's a great question. Can you go post it in the Q&A and I'll answer it there. And then you, that's the last time you have to answer that question for the semester. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. Okay. And Good. the other that's discussion a... that we really like having is, um, and it, it just it really depends on the dynamics of your um, your class. Mm -hmm. um, some students really love the student lounge. The student lounge is just an open, unmoderated discussion. Students can go in there and they can recruit colleagues essentially for um, study groups. Uh, they can you know, complain about, you know, some, something outside of class if they want to, mm -hmm. or they can seek help or whatever. It's just an open place um, for students to interact with one another. And, and I really only moderate that if, um, for, you know, like, whether students are trolling each other or posting inappropriate content. Otherwise, I don't, okay. I don't post in there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, that's real helpful. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, um, so you guys, uh, if you choose to use the course template, um, you will have lots of opportunities for exploring the content that in there. So I don't want to take up all of our time by reviewing it page by page. So what I'd rather do is show you how to actually get the template. Okay, and that document that I sent earlier, um, which I will copy one more time, just in case we had some late arrivals, and I'll place it in the chat. Da, da, da. There it is. All right, because sometimes late arrivals don't see that document. So uh, earlier chat items. So I just wanted to make sure that that's in there. Okay. Um, so now to find the online course template, you were going to go into comments. So how do we get to comments? Let's go back to the discussion. <laughs> uh, so here we are in uh, any class doesn't matter what class you're in. This left-hand bar over here, this blue bar that we see, and it depending on the college that you're at, the bar may be different colors, but this left-hand bar here is called the Global Navigation Menu. It doesn't change. It's the same no matter where you are in Canvas. And this little C with an arrow is for Commons. So if I click on that, it's going to take me to Canvas Commons, okay? And then I can search for the CRC online course template. And it really, it's pretty adaptive. Um, so I didn't even have to add anything more than CRC. Because <laughs> here we are, CRC online course template. So when I click on that, it's going to give you a preview of all of the content. And you can even um, click on these pages and you can see what's in the page. Okay, I don't recommend copying from here and pasting into a page because you will lose all of the formatting um, that is important for students using screen readers, like visually impaired students. So it's really important that you import rather than copy off of the, the Canvas Commons page. Okay, so importing. Importing can be achieved by clicking on this blue button here. But before we get to that, I wanna talk about where we should import our templates. 
anything on Canvas Commons can be updated at any time by the owner, which means that when I update the CRC online course template that you've imported into your class or classes, um, if you accept the updates, and usually those updates are up at the top here, if you accept those updates, then that means it's going to overwrite um, whatever you imported previously. And if you import the template and then edit the template and then accept updates later, it will overwrite your, the things that you put in there. I know, kind of a drag. So there's a way around this, and that is to get a dev shell. So when you click on the help menu down here in the global navigation menu, once again, there is an opportunity to request a development course. If you click on this, it's going to open up a dev course request form and you enter your course information and the name of your desired course and it will create a course for you in Canvas within two days that has no students in it. It is an unpublished empty shell. This is what it will look like. This is my dev course that I requested and it has nothing in it. So this is where we wanna start. We don't want to import the template into a course that has students or will have students in it. Because if during the semester I have to update something in the template, it may change things in your course. We don't want that to happen. So we put it in a demo or a dev shell, a sandbox course, if you will, and that's where we fool around with it. Everybody feel cool about that? If you already have a dev shell, um, you can import it into that. If you have an old class that you started using, you know, that maybe it was created, but it didn't actually have any students ended up in it, you can use that as well. Just make sure you're doing this in a class that doesn't have any students in it. Hey, Jenna. Okay. Yeah. Hear? This is Jeff Kimbler. I'm from the art department. Yeah. Hi. I just want to clarify, because um, I'm a big picture person, otherwise I get lost. So <laughs> what you're showing us right now to get a, a blank shell, is that simply for the purpose of getting a hold of the um, the template and then sort of tweaking it for ourselves? And then yes. once we do that, then we'll take parts from that into yes. our courses? Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So okay. you're going to take the template, put it in a dev shell, in a sandbox course, and then essentially play around with it in there and then export it into your course that has students into it. And would you import the whole thing or you import it like piece by piece? Well, it depends. Um, okay. In the document that I've shared with you guys, um, I suggest that you import, that you never do an entire course copy ever, ever. Um, <laughs> because you end up importing a bunch of stuff um, that you may not need, like extra files, duplicates of the CRC logo, or duplicates of the CRC Tutoring Center link. Um, so when you import a course into, say, your production, your live course that'll have students in it, import only certain items, and you can select a whole bunch of stuff, and I can show you what that would look like. Um, so if I wanted to import in the settings area, you can choose import course content and select copy a canvas course. But right here, instead of selecting all content, you select specific content. And then that will bring up a menu of options that you can choose from. I do that all the time. I'm, I much prefer to do individually piecemeal, even if it's, you know, like 15 modules worth of stuff, I'd rather do that than select an entire course, because then I don't have to go out and sort the garbage later. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think it makes sense. So once you've edited the imported um, template, and made it the yes. way you want it, then you then you take those things and import those parts into your other shell for your class. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. That's right. Okay, so let's talk about how we're gonna import the template into our course. Um, so if we go um, to the homepage of our of our dev shell, um, there is an option here, a little button that says import from comments. So if you click that button, it'll take you to comments. 
this button right here on the left hand side in the global navigation menu will take you to the exact same place. So it doesn't really matter which one you push. Either way, you're going to end up here in comments where you do a search for the CRC online course template. So far, so good. So we click on the template, we decide we want to import this and it's going to import all of it. Okay, so we click import and then we get this list of classes to choose from. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of classes here. I'm going to choose just one. I'm going to choose my Jenna's demo shell. And then I'm going to scroll down to the very bottom and choose import into course. And what that's going to do is it's going to import the template into my sandbox course. And so my sandbox course will end up looking just like my template course. So I'm in my template course right now, um, but the eventually the course, um, the demo shell will look like that as well. Are you recording this? Are you recording this so we can go back and look? Yeah, I should be, yeah. Okay, all right, good, <laughs> good. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. I have a question about if you, if you created that um, sandbox course, is there, was there a place that you would name it first so it shows up in the list? Yes. Yeah. So when you're creating your dev course here, um, there's an option at the bottom for you to put in your desired portion of the course name. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to end up looking like my practice course, but it will have CRC dev before it. You can always delete that later. And that's what I've done with mine. I got rid of the CRC dev Jenna's demo course and just put it as Jenna's demo instead so i just renamed it a little bit and you can rename it afterwards in the settings some of my some of my dev shells have gone through multiple namings <laughs> over the years <laughs> to help them sort of populate where i want them to on the course menu <laughs> all right so let's see if we've got anything in here yet oh look at that so now we're in my demo course and we have the template so there it is Okay, so um, because of the issue with um, because of the issue with the templates being uh, anything you import from Commons being overwritten, I strongly encourage you to create a copy of all of this stuff in your dev shell and then edit it. And I know that seems kind of strange because it's going to make things really clunky in your dev shell. But again, if you spend all this time editing your orientation module, and then you accept an update into your, um, your, your dev shell from commons, then it will erase everything that you did and replace it with the newest version of the dev shell. I know, it's kind of a drag. So um, what I suggest doing is identifying the items that you know you're going to want and placing them into a new module. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new module. So here we go, new module up in the right hand corner. And I'm going to call this module name my new orientation module. You can always rename this later when you put it into your other course. So that is going to create a new orientation module at the bottom of the page. So here it is. And in this orientation module, I am going to add some stuff that I think I might want to use. So let's say I want to, I definitely want to make sure that I have a welcome message. So to do that, rather than moving this original welcome message, I'm going to duplicate it. Welcome to message from your instructor copy. And then I'm going to move it. And there's a couple ways you can move it. Probably this way is easier. I'm going to click the three little dots menu, click move to, and I'm going to place it in my new orientation module. So there it goes. So now I have my copy and I want to edit this because this is about me. This is about my class, right? So I've opened up this page and now I can edit it. So this is going to be welcome message from Professor Trench. Okay, so now it's got a new name. And now we know it's not going to be edited by any updates coming from comments for the template if I update the template at a later date, which inevitably I will because links will change or whatever. Okay. And so I'm going to delete 
all of this purple stuff here because those are instructions that are no longer tenure, um, no longer relevant. And then I'm going to edit this new information by clicking, changing links and what have you. Okay. And then I'll save and publish it. This is Jackie. Can I help you? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm still on my regular job too. Oh, I understand. Okay. So yes. It's I hear somebody I'm asking a question. Hey. Um, I just have a question about. Hi, Deborah. Hi. I, I just have a question about updates. How do we find out if you've made an update during the semester? So updates are not automatic. Um, you can find out about updates whenever. So let's just. Um, I'm just going to click. I'm going to right click on the comments. I'll open it in a new tab so it doesn't mess up any of the tabs I'm currently working on. And so I, here I am, and this is my personal version of Commons, right? So it has my favorites on there, and it also keep it's linked to my account, so it keeps track keeps track of what I've imported. And so you know I've imported the CRC branch out. Well, actually, no, not really. <laughs> Um, it's automatically placed in all of our courses when they're created. Um, so you probably have this update already in your courses. Um, but if you choose to accept the update, you click update and it'll tell you which specific shell, which course it's going to automatically update. So in this case, it's going to update this particular rubric sample shell that I imported it into. Um, if you have multiple classes, it will allow you um, where you have imported a, an item from Commons, it will list all of them here and it will allow you to select different ones and choose to update. Or if you choose to not accept the update, you can click dismiss and it, it doesn't stop all notifications. It just won't notify you again about that one, but it will tell you next time that item is updated and you'll have that option again to um, excluded. But see the advantage, one of the advantages of once again using a dev shell um, for the template is that when you export from your dev shell into your student courses, your live production courses, um, Commons no longer tracks it because it's now coming from one of your existing courses. So your existing, your courses with your students are not going to be affected by any template updates because you've pushed it from a dev shell. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, can I just ask a quick question too? Yeah, of um, course. Go again, for it. Just Shoot. to kind of review what you did. So um, after you imported the uh, template, you uh, created a new module and you copied some stuff in there. So if, if, you're, if what you imported then gets updated, it's not going to update the new module. So it's going to update other things in there, but not correct. The new module. Yeah. So right? let's go back to my, that's right. So let's go back to my, um, my demo shell. Now, because I literally just imported the template, there aren't going to be any updates for the content that I've put in here. But let's say that next spring, I come back to this dev course to Jenna's demo shell, and I want to see if there are any updates on comments. So, um, Go to my home page. Okay. Um, somewhere in here, there's a place for us to locate whether there are check for updates. I'm not seeing it in here. Sometimes it, I feel like it's in here somewhere, but maybe it's not. Regardless, um, if there is an when there is an update to the template, what's going to happen is you will have the option in Commons to accept the update. You can choose to have it updated in your dev shell. And when you click update, the only things that are going to be overwritten are the original items that you put in here. Okay, so this stuff here, this stuff in the original course orientation, but my new orientation module with my new pages that I copied and edited will not be updated. So those are always gonna be safe to import into courses and later dates, later semesters, because they won't have any of the updates. Now, okay, again, you're like, well, why would I want to not accept the updates on those pages? Well, because all that purple text is going to overwrite what you entered in there. 
So you can always go and look at the, um, let's go hide, close. You can always go to the actual document, the actual item on um, to comments like the template and click the version notes and it will show you the most recent update. So in this case, the last update I pushed out was July 27th and I added the lab waiver module with the lab waiver survey. And so that would give you a clue. Okay, well, you know, I, I want to accept those updates because I want to see what she did and then I'm going to add it to the stuff that I already have. Hopefully that's not too convoluted. Um, I guess the only way that I can sell this <laughs> is that, um, you know, you can always just preview this stuff and look at these pages and be like, oh yeah, okay, I'd like to include that. Um, however, the disadvantage of just referring to this and not actually importing it and modifying the imported material is that you don't get the advantage of having the accessible content, the accessible pages that have been formatted with headings and links that are appropriately named and using bulleted lists and numbered lists and all that stuff. Like I've done all the formatting for you, which will save you a lot of time. Um, you know, if you were to go back and, and build this stuff from scratch, it might take you like weeks. So that, that's, I think that's the, the reason why you would want to grab it. So I'm going to go back and check my um, how to use the CRC online course template just to make sure that I have talked about everything on here. Um, so this document that I've shared with you all has um, links for how to accept import or accept updates for commons how to import items from commons, and then also how to do some of the um, more basic features that I talked about in um, my little demo, which is copying items, creating modules, renaming pages, and editing pages. Okay, I am quite happy to walk you through step by step any of that stuff if you'd like to see it in more detail. Just let me know. Okay, I want to just thank you, Jenna, for all the work you've done on this. It saved me a lot of time. Yeah, I, um, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, the, the template is tailored to CRC. Um, it has lots of links in it um, to support students um, as far as uh, access to all of the online services that we're now offering for students. Those are linked there. Um, it also kind of sets up a good practice for how to deliver um, your content. And so in the module, I have a sample, a sample learning module of what it would look like to actually like convert essentially your week of class into a module. So this right here represents the sort of book ending nature that we like to have with, um, um, with, with our modules. Think of the modules as like um, a textbook, right? And so each module represents a chapter in the textbook. Um, the textbook always starts with an overview and a, and then finishes with a conclusion. And within that area, it's divided up into sections, right? So the same basic principle can be applied to the module. The module overview will have the introduction to the topics. You can tell students about what it is that they're going to be learning. You would include objectives for that particular unit. Um, these objectives can be stolen straight out of the textbook that you're using, or if you're not using a textbook, or if you feel like customizing it, you can always do that. Um, I've included a demo here for what an um, overview page would look like, and it includes a description, the objectives for that module, and then a to-do list. When students click next, as we want them to, we want to train them to click next to the modules, as they click next, it will take them to their knowledge building or the sort of the lecture component of, um, of the module. The um, teaching online is a little bit different than teaching face-to-face -face because 
um, some of the stuff that we would usually use face to face like board work or handouts or PowerPoints doesn't necessarily necessarily translate into teaching online. Um, so if you have a lot of PowerPoints, I encourage you to think about maybe converting those into a voice over video um, in no longer than 10 minute increments. So if it's a 50 minute lecture, you would divide that up into a series of short videos um, using PowerPoint or Studio, which is something that we have built in that allows you to essentially capture your presentation on the screen and then videotape over it. I don't have any in this particular class, but um, I've got some I can show you. Another where, where in the world would it be though? That's a great question. Let's just look in here and see if there's any videos in here. No, that didn't work. Anyway, um, <laughs> I will have to show you my stuff later. Oh, maybe it's in my library. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so for example, here's a video of a PowerPoint um, with me talking over it, you know, and so it just basically shows the slides and then my narration goes over the top of it. You can create that right in Commons, uh, excuse me, right in Canvas Studio, um, which is an active link in your in your classes. Or if it's not, you can add it very easily in the settings area by clicking on navigation and then pulling it from this lower menu up into the upper menu. I believe in the template, I've automatically enabled Studio and Zoom um, so that anyone who installs the template in one of their classes will have it show up. Yeah, Jeff, what's up? So um, I so I started using Canvas last semester and I- Yeah, and I saw some of your awesome videos. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I started using Studio and I that was a big uh, part of my teaching because I do a lot of um, demonstration stuff for drawing. Um, but just to clarify, so when you did your PowerPoint, mm -hmm. did you just, did you bring it on screen and use the screen capture and just kind of literally manually hit the forward and advance, you know, like the arrows on your keyboard and just kind of talk mm -hmm. as you did it mm -hmm. and just captured that? Is that how you did it? That that particular video was actually captured in Camtasia and then imported into Studio, but you can use Studio. Um, you can use studio for exactly that same that same method. Okay. Um, so essentially what you would do is you would open up your PowerPoint and put it into presentation mode. And then when you're using studio, you select that window, the presentation mode window um, as your screen that it will screen capture. And it does your I forget because it's been a few months now, but it'll let you uh, capture your mic at the same time. Yes. Yeah, you can choose to you can choose to allow the mic recording or not, and you can even have a little little you know floating head um, in there as well. If you want to have a talking head, you can add that too. You mean your camera? Can you? Yes. Okay. Yes, your camera on you. And you also mentioned something that was going to be my second question, which was mm -hmm. I was reading um, something off the template, and it mentioned using either Studio or Camtasia. So mm -hmm. that makes me ask the question: Is Camtasia something that's offered to us that the district provides or you just been on your own or uh, I've been, yeah, I've on heard our own. Camtasia and yeah so um camtasia did have a deal um last semester where they were uh, offering like free camtasia licenses um for a limited time i believe that that's now expired um because you know like everybody in the world would have free camtasia um <laughs> so uh so you can you can purchase Camtasia with an educational license. Um, I believe it's around hundred dollars, or at least it was when I purchased it last. Okay. Um, you could um, talk to your dean and see if your dean has any you know additional funding lined around for purchasing a few licenses of Camtasia. You could also talk to your dean to find out if you can get a, a VPN. Um, essentially to access a computer on campus that has Camtasia installed and use it that way, but there may be significant delays by doing that with the recording and maybe jumpy. Um, you can also uh, use Studio. Um, probably the best bet is to use the screen recording software that Studio employs, which is called, and I'm going to put it in here for you guys, And Deborah is familiar with this because we've talked about it before. 
Um, so Screencast-O-Matic is a free screen capture software that you can download onto your Mac or your PC. And it is the same screen capture software that is used by Studio. The advantage of using Screencast-O-Matic over, um, over Studio is that you can save your videos to your computer. Um, which means that you have the original copy. It's not hosted somewhere on Canvas's servers. Um, so there's an advantage there, right? And then you can upload it to Studio afterwards, but you always have the original. It's also helpful if you think maybe at some point you might want to post it on YouTube and add captions or something like that. So I would recommend using Screencast-O-Matic for free and then uploading the video that you've recorded onto your computer's hard drive um, and use and then having that in your studio by through an import. Jenna, can I add something? Sure. Yeah, Deborah, you've uh, got a lot more experience with this than I do. So no, I, do. I doubt that. <laughs> but um, what happened to me last semester was I was using the free Screencast-O-Matic and memory's a little bit fuzzy here, but I think the free only allows you to record a 15 minute video. Mm -hmm. And there were times where I was in the midst of explaining something where I needed a longer video and I, it, it, it cut me off somehow. So the, the short of it is, I recommend that you look at the upgrade to, I think it's 1995 or something. It's not a huge amount of money uh, for the one that lets you, gives you the ability to, to do longer uh, recordings. And the, uh, uh, maybe it's the deluxe. Yeah, I think that's yeah. it. There might even, it might have even been an educational, I don't know if this is the education. This, this, well, I clicked on education and this is what came up, so okay. I'm not sure. That must be it. Um, but, but as Jenna is saying, the ability to have that original MP4 on your desktop is huge, especially if you discover that you need to go back in and edit something. Mm -hmm. And that's where Camtasia comes in because you can open it in Camtasia and record new audio tracks. You can do transitions. You can do all kinds of things. Um, and that, you know, that, that's probably for down the road for folks that are new. But um, in retrospect, I wish I'd known this up front. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. The other question is, um, do both of these softwares, do they automatically compress them when the video is done recording? Because the reason I asked that is I played with Studio and um, the files were reasonably sized. And then I also used some uh, webcam software. I have uh, Logitech and the video files were huge. And then I had to go into Handbrake and compress them and then upload them. So does Camtasia and Screencast-O-Matic, do they, do they compress them automatically? Oh, man. Pat, are you around listening into the, in on this? And can you answer that? I remember. I'm a, I'm oh, good. You're here. OK, great. <laughs> Yes, the, 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 the answer to your question is yes, absolutely. You can go in and you can control the quality of the video. And uh, for, for a video going on the web, the quality is really, is really registered by the bit rate of the video. So you can increase it to make it high quality and therefore make it uh, a much larger file size, or you can decrease the, the quality by lowering the bit rate and the file size. What do you recommend that we do it at? For the stuff that we're doing here, you know, for instructional stuff, 1500 kilobytes, which is 1.5 megabytes a second, is just about perfect. Sorry, I got Thank you. Technical. Thank you, Pat. That You're saying was... it lets you set that <laughs> as you record it? Uh, no, I think it happens at the conclusion of, rec of, of the recording stage and into the compression stage, okay. the export stage, if you will. Okay, thanks. Do you know what the default is, Pat? Ooh, that I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, I've never paid attention to it, but I'm, yeah. I appreciate the heads up. Yeah, um, for in if the the general rule of thumb when it comes to compressing video for the web is if the video has a lot of movement, like let's shoot, let's say it's a sports video, then you want to have a pretty high bit rate so the quality is is good and you're going to be able to see. Um, the fast movement clearly, but if it's just like a PowerPoint slide where there's almost no movement on the screen itself, lower that bit rate down as far as you can. The compression engine is still going to retain the quality, but um, give you a pretty good manageable file size. Uh, can I add one other thing? Yes, please go right ahead. 
Uh, yeah, he was mentioning he had a Logitech uh, camera. On the uh, camera settings, instead of being in HD, you can go standard def, and that'll cut down some of the uh, mm. the bytes that you have to use. Okay, thanks. And, and I guess I'm also wondering, just, I, I don't mean to take up the whole thing here, but um, since I used the studio version or studio feature in Canvas and I got pretty used to the way that screen capturing worked, what, what does um, Camtasia offer significantly that's mm. better? Like you said something, is there editing tools or some yeah, tools? Let me I mean, why would I want to buy up, Camtasia? Let me open up Camtasia <laughs> for you and I will. I mean, if you can just you. point a couple things, that would be helpful. Sure, too. yeah. So um, one of the advantages of Camtasia is that you can really edit the video and you can create different layers on your video files. So if you okay. want to add animations or a quiz question, um, or sound effects or anything like that, you can, you can do that. Okay. Um, you can also have an ongoing project where, you know, you start it, record some, come back later, record more, add it in. Okay. Well, um, sound, doing... sound editing, I think is a little bit better. And then captioning. Captioning is, um, if you have a transcript file, editing captions in Camtasia is a breeze. So and then they're lot... really accurate captions and they're accessible. There's just a lot more editing options, it sounds like. I, I started using Adobe options. Rush last semester um, and I got really comfortable with that, but sounds like I could just invest in Camtasia. I have not used Rush. I have heard good things from other people though. So if it's, you know, Adobe Rush is free versus Camtasia is not. If Rush has editing features that are yeah. comparable, then it might be worthwhile. Um, Camtasia has a really amazing support website where you can watch demonstrations of all of the different features and see how they're used. So that might be good for product comparison. Okay, thanks. When it comes to stuff like this, uh, my general rule of thumb is you get what you pay for. Um, you pay, you know, 100 bucks or so, but man, you get a lot of stuff. Camtasia basically is like Premiere Pro or Final Cut Pro, custom built for screen casting and for online presentations. It's phenomenal. It's a good app. Okay, thanks. Um, question about um, the vi I, I've watched some of the videos on Camtasia. Are there any other um, educational resources for getting up to speed quickly, like a lynda.com course or something like that? Mm. I, you may want to look at lynda.com. They may actually have one. Yeah, I haven't looked. I, I've thought about th that would be kind of my ideal just to do a crash course. Yeah, and the state chancellor provides all of California Community College faculty access to lynda.com for free. Who does? Uh, yeah, through the state chancellor's office. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, if you give me a minute, I can give you a link. <laughs> Hold on a sec. Let's see if I can find it. Um, while Pat's looking for that link, um, are there any other questions that you guys have um, about the template or about specific elements of teaching online that you want a clarification on? Um, I am, I, you, You've got my attention, so I can, I'm happy to answer anything <laughs> that you want to ask. Oh, it looks like Pat has posted a link um, to the login for Linda on um, the chat. Yeah, and it's the State Chancellor's Office Professional Development Network. Um, and I believe you either have to make you either have to use your existing Los Rios credentials to log in or you have to create uh, a new username and password with your Los Rios credentials. Uh, but then once you're in, you get access to all the professional development materials that the state chancellor's office gives to us. And lynda.com is one of those things. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. That's wonderful. Has anybody clicked on that link just now? I just did and I got an error. <laughs> I got a security warning. So yeah, I'm me too. Okay. <laughs> so don't, maybe you just get, you know, now that I look at the link, there's, it's, you know, slash login at the slash end. Login. So maybe, yeah. maybe this is coming directly from my, uh, my list of links on my computer. So, um, right, let me try that without, without the login and see if that works. try the same. No, I'm still getting, <laughs> yeah, well, the same thing. Well, maybe they've changed something. Man, Pat, are you trying to like install some spyware on her? <laughs> Better believe it. That's how I roll. 
<laughs> Here, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll do some digging on this and see if, see if I can figure it out. And uh, I'll blast an email to the college and let everyone know that this is available because it's a good resource. And there's a lot of stuff on there that everyone should be checking out. Okay. Um, so in, in the last few minutes that we have, um, the link that I shared with you to the Google Doc, you have access to that. Um, you have the ability to download that document and save it. Um, I recommend that you do. Um, although the chat will be saved with this recording, um, it's still uh, advantageous to, to, to grab that right now. Um, if you have any questions about using the template, um, please don't hesitate to send me a message. Um, Jenna Trench. <laughs> uh, so that should, um, you know, I, I, I can, I'm happy to help with any issues that you come up with or questions you have about you using it. Um, just, you know, I hope you do get an opportunity to use it because um, it will save you a whole lot of time, um, especially with regards to the orientation module. So um, I hope you, I hope you find it helpful. <laughs> I actually do have my last question. Great. I feel bad at dominating this. No, no, keep so, them coming, keep them coming. I, so being kind of new to Canvas, so if you import that, if you create a dev shell and you import that, mm -hmm. um, when you go into Canvas and you see your classes listed there, will you also see the dev shell just like sitting alongside it kind of thing? Right, sure, let me, let me share my screen again. Okay, so here we are. So if I go to the global navigation menu, um, my ice cream truck going by right now. It's so sketchy. Um, <laughs> so anyway, if I go over here in my course menu, um, I can scroll down and in the unpublished courses area is my demo shell. So I can click on that right there and that will take me to my demo shell. And then if I want to put any of this stuff that I have used into an existing course, that's I didn't talk about that. So I can do that right now. So let's say I want to import this into another course. Uh, we'll just go to this right now. Okay, and in the settings area of a course, there is an import course content option on the right hand side. So if I click on import course content, I can choose to copy a Canvas course. And then I start typing the name and all of the courses that have that name in it belonging to me will show up. So I'll click Gemma's, Jenna's demo shell. I'm going to select specific content and then choose import. Once the demo shell um, is ready, I can use this select content option to choose what I want to import. So in this case, I am going to choose to import my new orientation module, and then I'm going to choose to import the page that I created, which was welcome message from Professor Trench. There we go and then select content. And so that's gonna run and that will add that material um, to my modules area. Notice that I only picked two things. I didn't pick everything. I just picked the single items that I wanted to have. One, this will make the import really fast. Um, and two, it will also save you from getting duplicates over here. So you won't get a duplicate for you know, CRC student services um, and have like five of those listed if you've ever experienced that. Um, that's a way around it. So if I go to my modules area, at the bottom of my modules area, I should have a new module. There it is. Welcome message from Professor Trump. Jenna? Yep. If, if you had just selected the module, would mm -hmm. it take the pages and everything that you've got there and bring it over? Or do you have to also take the individual things? You know, that's a great question. And Pat, maybe you know the answer to this. I'm so paranoid that I always go in and manually check the files and the pages asso and assignments associated with that module, but I don't know. Do you know, Pat? Does it automatically pick everything up? Can you repeat the question again? I was digging into the pro-learning thing. <laughs> Jenna, Jenna created the new module and then had a page in it. And when she went to copy it over, my question was, could she just select the module alone and that would bring the page in with it? Right, so, oh, um, so I don't it's a, think so. In, I think in this feature here, let's, let's try it out. Let's try it. So if I copy a Canvas course and we'll do Jenna's demo shell, select specific content. And I, this time I'm going to choose the instructor resources module, different modules that way and I'm not going to select anything else. Let's find out. 
So go down to the bottom again. Oh my gosh, it brought hey, the pages that. with it. Look at that. That's awesome. Thank you for but, asking, Deborah. Yeah, but are, th are they really there? <laughs> Will you click on one? <laughs> there it is. Yay! Oh my goodness. And guess what? It also brought the file with it. The f so the files come in too? I have to verify that because sometimes like these links, let's see if the links are to the right. Hey, and it updates the links too to the right. No, not everything though. So, um, so the problem is if you bring in something and you don't bring in everything that it links to, it's going to get an error. So how do I know this? So I've hovered over, you know, um, where's an example, this one right here. And this link links to a module that I didn't import. And so if a student clicks on that, they will get an error message. Yeah. I may not because I have access to it in my other class. That makes sense. But a yeah. student will. So if you can see at the very bottom left hand part of this corner, I can't point to it because it will go away. Notice that it has instructure.com slash forward slash courses, then a course number. You can check that course number and ver ensure that it matches up with the course number up at the top of the page in the URL like web address location. That's the first thing to check. The second thing to check is if it has some weird percent %24 Canvas object reference, that means that that object doesn't exist in your class. It exists somewhere else. So, so uh, that's a quick way to do a link validation without actually having to run the link validator. And I do that all the time because I'm lazy. Yeah. Okay, so it's not perfect, but it could save some time. Yeah, certainly, because I mean, it actually brought in this file. And I know that the file is in the class without actually going into the files menu, because once again, I look at the bottom left hand part of my screen and it shows the URL and the course number, which matches up with the actual course number that I'm in at the top of the page. Yeah. So that's handy. I'm glad you brought that up. That's going to save me some time. <laughs> Well, we're, um, we're technically out of time. Um, I am happy to answer any of your questions via email. And um, if there is a particular topic that you would like to see us host a workshop on in the future, um, please do let Pat and I know. Um, we would be quite happy to oblige. And I will... Um, uh, take this recording, it's going to be posted in the cloud. And um, if you would like a copy of the recording, please email me and I will send it to you. Sound good? Yes. Jenna, okay. thank you so much for your work. We really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Happy thank to help. <laughs> Actually, Jenna, I came in a little bit late. So how do I get to that Google Doc? Sure. I'll share it one more time in the chat right now. Thank you. You are welcome. So it's coming your way in the chat. Perfect. For those of you that were interested in the pro learning network stuff that I was talking about before to get access to the lynda.com stuff, it looks like the state chancellor's office has rebranded into the vision resource center. Oh yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And I'm yeah. about to, about to pull in now. So it looks like that's uh, that's where you go. Are you going to put the link in the chat then, Pat, or send it via email? I'll send it out via email. That way everyone gets it. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I have a link in here somewhere. What's it I called though? So I, I know to have my eye out for Vision, what? Vision Resource Center. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, this concludes our workshop. Thank you all. Nice to see you and good luck with the beginning of the semester. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Okay. Pat, I think you're hosting this meeting. So I am. Um, okay, I was, <laughs> I was literally just looking at that too. I was like, do I? I think I stopped the recording. I think, so. I think you have the recording. <laughs> okay. All right.